so Charles Ridley had developed his list of uh, different competencies that uh, seemed to be essential. There was another person, J. Allen Thompson, and he actually did his doctoral research examining uh, the characteristics of church planters who seem to be effective. He, he examined uh, or questioned interviews with 58 church planters and then 28, uh, 26 people who did assessments of church planters. Uh, later on, he did some follow-up work and revised his list. Um, priority was given to spirituality, prayer, integrity. So there's a whole spiritual dimension. Then there was a skills dimension of uh, leadership, evangelism, preaching, these kinds of things. And then more of the personal uh, characteristics of flexibility, resilience, and so on. Uh, one thing was he didn't see any correlation between age. In other words, uh, older people can be effective church planters, young people can be effective church planters. That did not seem to be a factor that made a big difference. Um, there did seem to be a correlation though between the size of the church and the competencies that a person had. And uh, it seemed that some of the churches would, that planted uh, grew more quickly uh, with church planters who had these competencies. Um, this is sort of his revised list, and you can tell that it's very similar to the Ridley list. There are more spiritual qualities here, integrity, personal spiritual dynamics, a, a person's prayer life, a person's uh, own spiritual disciplines, missional engagement. This would be the community connectedness, the com community involvement type of thing, uh, visionizing capacity, gospel communication, learning agility. Now this is maybe a somewhat different one from the Ridley list. In other words, the ability to learn, and this is kind of the adaptability idea, that you get into situations and, and in church planning you always run up against a wall somewhere where it just you don't know what to do, you don't know how to move forward, and you have to learn how to adapt You've got to learn how to find new resources to solve your problems. And so this sort of learning agility, he calls it. He speaks of emotional stability. So, you know, you're going to have those days where you're feeling really good. Things are going great and people are responding. You're going to have those bad days where, boy, it just seems like nothing's working and people leave, there's setbacks or conflict. You've got to have that emotional stability. If you're a real roller coaster sort of emotional person, um, it's going to be difficult for you. Family life, we already spoke about. Expectation of results. Uh, managerial courage, in other words, to make difficult decisions um, to effectively lead. And so his list is uh, you know, quite similar to the Ridley list, but as I mentioned, has a few more uh, sort of probably stronger spiritual emphasis. There was a very different kind of list that was made by two researchers, Dick Grady and Glenn Kendall. And they looked at the qualities of effective church planners. They wrote this up some years ago in Evangelical Missions Quarterly, an artic article called Seven Qualities of Effective Church Planners. And they were mainly looking at um, missionary church planters. And uh, their list looks like this. More effective church planters spend more time in prayer. So this would be consistent with what we've been saying all along, uh, the prayers of Paul and the, the spiritual dynamics involved in church planting. More effective church planters use more broadly based evangelistic efforts. In other words, they use evangelistic efforts that, that have the potential of touching more people so that they can find the people that are most responsive. And this is one of the problems if we use only highly relational friendship evangelism. You know, I may only know, can only know so many people. None of them may be open to the gospel. But effective church planners, they figure out ways to build more relationships with more people, or they may have other methods, uh, you know, mass methods to contact many, many people to find the responsive people that God has prepared. And we'll talk about that more when we talk about the subject of evangelism. They're more flexible in their methods. As we've said before, they're willing to adapt and change. If things are not working, let's do something different. You know the definition of insanity is to keep doing the same things the same ways, expecting different results. If you keep doing what you've always done, you get what you always got. 
And so if what you're doing, God is just not blessing it and people are not responding to it, you need to change. More effective church planters are more committed to a doctrinal position. Now, this is kind of interesting. We would say, well, what's that got to do with church planting? Well, I think it has this to do with church planting. If you enter trying to lead a church, you may have people from various different backgrounds. And as the question earlier, you may have people who have very strong convictions. I want to see this. And another person says, well, I'd like to see this in this new church. The church planter has to be a person who has very clear convictions and even in doctrinal matters. Um, so that uh, what about the gifts of the Spirit? Or what about the role of women in the church? And all these things that a, a young fledging church could end up getting into all kinds of arguments and theological debates about. And I can tell you in a church plant, you do not have the energy for that. You don't have the energy to be having infighting with other Christians. And so the church planner is usually going to be someone who says, these are my convictions. This is my belief system, and this is the way we're going to lead this church. Now, hopefully they're not too rigid, but if it's too unclear, you really leave the door open for potential conflict. And so this, I find, is a kind of an interesting point. More effective church planners establish greater credibility. Now, what do we mean by that? Credibility means that the people I'm trying to reach, especially, they view me as a person who is credible, a person of integrity, a person who can be trusted. So I need to find ways to build trust with people. You see, when I, as an evangelist or a church planter, come into a situation and I'm expecting people to commit their lives to Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, who lived 2,000 years ago, who was rejected by his own people, was executed by the government. Why should a person commit their life to Jesus Christ? And for many people in the world, they say, look at Christians. Christians are hypocrites. Look at the so-called Christian countries of the world. Well, the Christian countries have crime. They have homosexuality. They have drugs. Um, they have all kinds of problems. Why would I want to become a Christian? Church planters have to be able to build the trust with people that, that a lot of those criticisms begin to fall away because they can say, you know, this person is a good person. This person is a person of integrity. I was speaking with some workers in a major Muslim country, the, the largest Muslim country in the world, and they were, they were seeing Muslims come to faith in Jesus Christ. I said, well, what are some of the things that are happening? Well, one of the things that happens is many Muslims have dreams that Jesus appears to them or something happens in a dream that turns them towards Christ. But they said, you know, we came to serve and, and many of the people will say, you are here really to serve us. You're, you're people of compassion. And they didn't expect that. And because they began to experience genuine Christians as people who cared, people of compassion, people willing to make sacrifice for others, people were not just in it for what they could get, that began to soften their hearts. They began to listen. And so more effective church planners establish that kind of trust, credibility. Sometimes it's the way we even present ourselves in public that builds credibility or makes us look suspicious. So we need to be alert to those things. More effective church planners have a great ability to identify and work with people who have a loosely structured religion. Now what this is basically saying is our experience is that people who are involved with a religious system that's highly structured, it's highly organized, uh, say Hinduism, where you have a whole system of temples and sacrifices, or, or Islam, which has uh, a very strict uh, sense of guidelines and rules and so on, uh, they tend to be harder people to reach. People who have a more loose, a more vague view of religious views, many times these are folk religions uh, or even atheists who, who don't have strict creeds and strict practices, 
they tend to be people who can be reached more easily. So church planners have a way of, ident the more effective ones, can identify those people who are more open to change. They have a greater ability to incorporate new converts into evangelistic outreach. Now this is also a real key to church growth and multiplication. You see, if the only evangelist is, is me, the church planter, or a few Christians who came with me, we're going to be very limited in who we can reach. But new believers, they've got all kinds of friends who are not Christians. In fact, probably all their friends are non-Christians. And they have relationships and credibility with their family and their friends, their work colleagues. And if they can communicate the gospel and say, look at what Christ did in my life. And if they can, and they speak the language, they know how non-Christians think because they were a non-Christian not very long ago. And so when, when new believers share their faith, they just share it in a way that sometimes older believers uh, wouldn't think because they've, they've, they've come out of that world. They know what it means to be a non-Christian. They know what a non-Christian's thinking and feels. They know what the, critic, the points of criticism are and what the questions are. And sometimes a brand new Christian just kind of has that zeal. You know, they, they sometimes <laughs> are not very wise. They've got that zeal and it becomes contagious. And they have these relationships. And so key is going to be helping those new believers share their faith with their friends and their circles. And that begins a ripple effect. And we found this to be true so many times uh, where we had worked and worked for about a year and a half in the city of Ingolstadt where, in Germany where we were planning a church. And for about the first year and a half, you know, we just saw very little evangelistic fruit. And then we did a major evangelistic campaign and several people came to faith in Christ just pretty much strangers had come to these meetings, had become followers of Christ. And we quickly encouraged them, invite your friends, tell your friends about this. And they started doing that. They, in fact, they started inviting their friends to the follow-up group from the evangelization. And it began a ripple effect. And then they told other people. And before you knew it, more and more people were coming to Christ, not through us, but through the new believers. And so this is one of the things that effective church planners do. They mobilize those new believers to be sharing their faith. They, they uh, release them. They train them how to do that. So those are, we'll talk more about evangelism later, but that's a very different sort of way of looking at characteristics of effective church planters. Have you benefited from our teaching ministry? Have you found TVS videos helpful and relevant? Please consider supporting us with your prayers and financial gifts. For more information, visit tvsseminary.com.